talks. STED stands for Spine, Technology, Education, and the D is Discussion, Discovery, Debate. And again, we'll have a great opportunity to have the debate part today, but also the discovery part in our uh, lecturing professor. This is Dr. Timothy Witham, and he's the professor of neurosurgery and orthopedic surgery at Johns Hopkins. And he is going to talk about new frontiers in terms of intraoperative visualization of patients and using augmented and uh, uh, enhanced uh, other methods of uh, visualization of patients to try to achieve sometimes very complex goals of surgery surgery with less invasive strategies. So really looking forward to his lecture. As always, we want to start off the day with discussions of cases. And uh, since we have a professor of Johns Hopkins here, we thought it would be a great segue to have one of his eminent uh, residents and uh, a former residents that is uh, uh, present a recent case of ours and see what he would do and see his thoughts as to what went wrong uh, prior to getting fixed. So Dr. Amanda Sassino is uh, MD, uh, PhD here with us and uh, she came from Johns Hopkins and so she's gonna have a recent C-spine case. Amanda, come on up. Good morning, and good morning, Dr. Witham. Ben, do we have a audible? Good morning, Dr. Witham. Tim. Good morning, Tim. Tim, can you unmute yourself? Yes, I am here. Thank you. So, can you hear me? Dr. Suno has a case that we'd like to have your opinion on. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Good morning, Dr. Witham. Morning. So, today I want to talk about a great case we did and really focus on the attention to preoperative imaging that needs to be placed to ensure a smooth case and a good outcome for the patient. So for a brief background, the patient's a 70-year-old female with some significant medical comorbidities. Uh, most pertinent is osteoporosis. She came into clinic in a wheelchair uh, with a Miami J collar on. She was holding her head in severe pain and had it tilted to the left, also known as the cock robin head position. She was very malnourished and stated that she had lost 80 pounds due to pain with chewing. She had some grip weakness on exam, but no other overt signs of cervical myelopathy. So just for a brief history, she had a mechanical fall in 2019, which resulted in a type two odontoid fracture. Initially, the outside surgeon tried conservative management with a Miami J. However, she wasn't healing and had a greater displacement of her odontoid, so she underwent a C12 fusion. She did well initially, but presented back in 2020 with increasing neck pain. There was a delay in getting her CT until 2021, and at that point, it showed significant loosening of the hardware and erosion of the left inferior C1 lateral mass. You know, and looking at the axial CT, I just wanna point out that at this point, she doesn't have significant rotation of C1 it's on C2. She was also taken for a revision with removal of hardware. Uh, her surgeon didn't want to fuse to the occiput at that time because it would limit her range of motion. So he wired her C12 together. So in the months that followed, she developed a progressive left head tilt uh, with increasing left-sided head pain. And on FlexX imaging, her ADI was greater than five, which denotes instability. Typically, the value, I think, is around three. Uh, we didn't have an MRI for her to assess her transverse ligament. So on CTA of her head and neck, uh, you can, it grossly shows the left deformity tilt of her head. And additionally, I wanted to point out that she had more displacement of her odontoid fracture, along with erosion and collapse of the C12 joint on the left and subluxation of the right C12 joint, which was the cause of her left head tilt. And then looking through the axial cuts, you'll notice that compared to the initial CT I showed, there is a new rotational dislocation of C1 on C2. And additionally, she had developed a Jefferson fracture of her posterior C1 arch at the site of the wire loops. And we were also concerned that because of this rotary subluxation, her left vertebral artery was now abutting the wire cable. 
So do you mind going back towards the initial thing? So these are some pretty dramatic images. What do you want? Uh, yeah, the, the initial images. So Tim, so are these more geriatric era um, odontoid fractures, the same scourge uh, on the East Coast that they are here on the West Coast? <laughs> uh, we see a lot of them. And I think that uh, the manage, it's safe to say the management of these fractures is controversial. So this is obviously one of those horror cases. So um, what is your paradigm uh, in terms of non-operative versus operative treatment? Do you veer towards yeah. surgical care or do you veer towards non-operative care? Can you just give us some of the guidelines that you yeah, use? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you, look, you have to, you have to take it uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. And I would say that I typically uh, lean in favor of surgery for type two uh, geriatric odontoid fractures. But I think that, you know, as you guys know, the, the, you know, one geriatric patient is not the same as the other. And uh, I think this concept of, you know, frailty and um, physiologic age really comes into play here. And so I think you sort of have to get a sense of the, the patient's uh, oh, level of functioning uh, and medical comorbidities, because I think that's very important when trying to determine, you know, if you're going to take an operative or a non-operative approach. And so I try to get the best sense of whether or not I think the patient's going to tolerate an operation. Um, if the comorbidities are too significant and the patient is not high functioning and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to potentially treat them in a collar. I mean, I think that it's probably pretty well established these days that a halo is not an option. I think it's either a collar or you have some type of, uh, fixation approach. For me, it's the, you know, the typical harms approach as was done in this case, uh, with a C12 fusion, uh, a couple of maybe technical points that I would make. Um, I, I, I'm not sure on their original x-rays or images, I always like to put a cross link at C1 because I think that that does provide some rotational instability there or stability uh, in this particular area, which is I think critical. Um, the, uh, you know, I don't put cross links in hardly at all anywhere else in the spine, but I think this is one indication for it. And the other thing that I think it is important is I typically will use BMP um, because, you know, I don't want a pseudoarthrosis like the one that was shown here, because at that point it is a disaster, as you mentioned. Um, well, let, me, let me interject there. Uh, I want to actually go back a little bit, but uh, since you mentioned uh, BMP, so for the audience sake, this is obviously an off-label application of this, and we do not endorse this officially as SSF, but uh, as is commonly known, this is one of the more established bone healing um, adjuvants that we have uh, in terms of really making effective difference. I just wanted to comment on that. Let me ask you practically, where do you put that? Because this lady, uh, as Amanda has pointed out, actually had a Jefferson fracture also. So do you just put that over the arches or do you put but that I in the joints? Okay, I think that uh, my understanding is the Jefferson fracture occurred after they wired her. Is that true yes. or not? Yeah. Yes. So, I mean, I don't know that it matters either way. But so for me, um, and that's a that's a great question as well because for me, I will typically actually transect both C two nerve roots. Um, I, I don't find that in the geriatric population they get. Um, they, they just don't complain about that too much afterwards. I think you do have to take some care in transecting it proximal to the, to the, uh, the DRG if you can. Um, but what that does for me is that allows me to look directly at the C12 joint. And I can get inside the joint. I can even, um, you know, potentially stick a, a small burr into the joint and decorticate the C12 joint after I've made holes for the instrumentation. And so for me, I'm going to, again, off-label use for sure. Um, I, I can actually put a small pack of BMP inside that C12 joint, splitting it in half and, you know, a small amount on each side. 
So, so Tim, you just made my partner, Dr. Oskoyan's day, because we have an uh, almost religious warfare going on between nerve cutters and nerve preservers, and Dr. Oskoyan is a nerve cutter. Rod, do you want to comment on Dr. It's always the ner It's always the neurosurgeons that cut the nerves, right? The orthopedic folks don't want to do that. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think it, you know, it um, enables you to uh, get more bone surface area and, you know, um, at 80 years old, 75 years old, usually my experience is patients don't complain about it. Um, and then for me, it also gives me a little bit more visual anatomy, like on a case like this, where you can really try to distract the joints, put a graft in, um, and manipulate uh, that whole area. And, and the venous plexus there, uh, it's much easier to control bleeding too. So, Yeah, 100%. Agree with all those great points. <laughs> but yeah. so but I no, I, I mean, I understand the, the uh, you know, a lot of folks don't like to cut the C2 nerves. I, you know, uh, one of my former partners was, was against that as well. And uh, he seemed to do very well without, without it. I, I think it makes it more challenging. And, uh, I, you know, I like to dummy it down a little bit, make it more simple. Oh, it's not dummying down the, the, we don't have real evidence on this. The only evidence I found is that if you, dissect out the C2 root, uh, the overall blood loss seems to be substantially higher, but substantial, I mean, I think from what I remember from that article, it's like 200 cc's in that realm. So it's not massive, but uh, regardless of what you have to be somewhat experienced, because I will also admit that elevating the C2 root is painful and uh, is not straightforward. You don't have a straight shot into the joint and you're quite right in a patient like this, um, obviously, there was not a Atlanto axial joint fusion done, right, Amanda? This was not done. So, and there was kind of a unilateral neurolysis performed on the side that was on not the collapsed. right side. Yeah, they took the C2 nerve root, but not on the left. Now, I wanted to bring up one more quick tangent before, uh, as I'm interrupting Dr. Sassino's beautiful presentation. So, you're from a very famous institution, Johns Hopkins, and you mentioned the frailty word before. So, your institution has kind of really helped uh, popularize this. Is this actually an index that you routinely use on your older or more infirm patients? Is this frailty index actually in clinical use? Uh, I personally have not used it. I know I think Dan Shuba has published on that a fair amount. Um, I can't say I've actually personally used it. I think for some of the cancer cases, it, it you know, is, is more commonly utilized. I haven't used it in this setting, but I guess I, uh, you know, I think that's a great point. There's, there's probably more scientific, uh, inquiry that could, could be looked at there, but I, I just use my best kind of clinical gestalt, um, and talk with the family, talk with some of my internal medicine colleagues and, and just try to get a sense for the patient's physiologic age, maybe more so than their actual chronological age prior to making the recommendation for surgery. So I interrupted Dr. Sassino rudely. Can you just quickly point out again what we're seeing here and then uh, commence before we'll interrupt you again and ask Dr. Witham for his salvage suggestion? So basically the patient has a rotary subluxation of C1 on C2. Um, and one of the main concerns is that when this deformity had occurred, we saw on the CTA that her left vertebral artery is abutting the cable. So what are your thoughts on the salvage option done by a surgical colleague where uh, our surgical colleague put cables around C1, C2 to try to get a fusion after failed segmental fixation with a Goel harm screws. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was probably destined for um, failure, uh, but I guess that's also easy to see now, or to say now that- Wow, we just lost our feed. We lost our feed, Tim, hold your thoughts. Okay. Oh, now we can hear you again. Good. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, I think it was probably destined for failure, but that's easy to say, you know, in hindsight, seeing, seeing the results, I, I guess my thought was if you were going to consider a, a salvage approach, I think the occiput is probably reasonable at that point. Um, the other option, I think, and it would depend upon, I think, being able to, uh, was it before the second surgery that she was subluxed or was it, or was she still lined up okay, Amanda? Um, 
when she had the C12, the screws in, she wasn't subluxed. Her yeah. alignment was fine. So She's I think another so possible uh, bailout technique, although I haven't done it before, uh, would be to consider looking at, you'd have to study the CT very carefully and see if, if the option of C12 transarticular screws uh, would be a possibility in combination with a wiring technique. I think if you really wanted to save the occiput, you could consider that. But I think it, if I were in the situation uh, of the failed fusion up front, I probably would have gone to the occiput at that point. And uh, this is a great segue to one of the questions in the chat room. Dr. Chinmay Padhari was really alert and he said, can we do anterior transarticular fixation? So why don't we look at your next studies because that shows us the 3D anatomy a little bit better, Amanda, and then we can pick up on that thought of anterior transarticular screws. Sure. And also just note again that we did not have an MRI for the patient to look at the transverse ligament because that may go along to that point in the future. So the patient was admitted from clinic to the hospital where she was optimized for surgery. Uh, during the surgery, we put her in 20 pounds of traction. Because we went into the case having a better understanding of the 3D anatomy, we were able to do a safe dissection. Uh, we visualized the vert on the left and we were able to safely separate the wire and protect the artery for the duration of the case. So we removed the wiring, decorticated the C12 joints bilaterally, and then with opening the collapsed left joint, we visualized and sacrificed the C2 nerve root. We then placed our instrumentation from O to C4. Uh, of note, the C1 lateral mass was so eroded that we couldn't fit a screw there, and the left C2 was so eroded that we placed a translaminar screw. Uh, we then did open reductions of the bilateral C12 joints using allograft. It was a modified ACDF spacer with BMP. Um, once we had the rods in place, we distracted on the left and compressed on the right to straighten the alignment of the head. And after the screws were final tightened, uh, we wedged an iliac crest structural allograft between the occipital plate and the spinous process of C2, which we secured with a wire cable. So post-op, the patient looked like a different person. Um, I had to use the scout films from the post-op CT, but you can see the improvement of her head alignment. Her ADI was normalized. She was up and walking the next morning after surgery. She went home on post-op day two. You know, I just want to highlight that I think all of this was possible because she got a great surgery, but you know, more importantly, because we took the time to plan out the surgery and to optimize her prior to surgery. I think that was a really nice presentation. I love how you highlighted the vertebral arteries and uh, the need for present uh, preparation beyond technology. Uh, so that was really cool. And collaborating with our vascular colleagues uh, was uh, awesome. Any comments on this, Tim? And uh, uh -huh. how can technology enable us in a safe fashion and not have us overreach? That's probably the big question of the day. I mean, I love the case. Um, fantastic job. Um, it just, I mean, I, just some great uh, learning points there. I love the the uh, C12 uh, ACDF cages. I've, I've done that a few times. Um, that's a great technique. And uh, one, actually, one question I would have for you: uh, Did you guys find that when you put the patient in traction, that it reduced a lot of that subluxation prior to to actually even really getting started? Because that's one of the things that I have sort of emphasized with our uh, trainees is that you're always better off if you can get things lined up before you actually start the procedure. Now, obviously there are techniques that you can use intraoperatively, but but putting the traction on, I think, you know, may have been critical in this case. Tell me how that, you know, how you felt that was. Uh, yeah, she did reduce a little uh, when we added on the, the 20 pounds of traction. And then, you know, right, right as we were about to tighten the rods, we did apply some more manual traction. Um, and we did get interop, interop uh, x-rays, but just for the sake of time, I kind of, you know, didn't include them in the presenta presentation, yeah. but she did have some reduction. Yeah. We, we wedged an allograft into the deficient left C1, C2 joint and tamped that into place. And that was kind of a guesstimate. We had uh, an active distraction going on during that time to kind of build up that left column again yep. and, and compress on the right side. But yeah. it was yeah. a little bit more 
just kind of gestalt and looking at her and we, we use sea arm with a hard palate as a reference to have kind of a level skull base relative to the cervical spine. Okay. Yeah, no, it was a great case. Both gestalt, yeah. But so the, the main points are, again, I, I still am perplexed about type 2 odontoid fractures to some degree because I think we should fix them early. I completely agree with the initial indication. Not sure why this didn't fuse, uh, but there are a couple of risk factors. The cabling afterwards is probably a little bit suspect an option. And again, we don't want to fuse to the occiput. All of us really don't do that. But uh, once you have a non-union, I think these are actually serious pathologies. And just this last week, and I was on call, and we had a patient with a type 2 odontoid fracture who was not treated surgically, and he basically became quadriparetic, and he was 82, and the family decided to withdraw support for him. So it's kind of very sad because this was a very fixable fracture. All right. Any thoughts about occiput uh, uh, as a primary fixation? I think that's overused by some, but underused in other cases. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think on that, on this, this is a typical example of, you know, I do think um, the, at least from what the scans are probably an unstable odontoid fracture to begin with, and then probably, you know, having the pseudo and then, um, you know, further, I think on the pre-op images, it looked like the patient had a cocked you know, um, skull. Um, so I think, you know, I think you're, you almost have to go to the occiput in those cases. There's not really a good salvage procedure. Good. Well, Amanda, thank you so much for this uh, nice demonstration and your nice work in the OR there. And we have a collaborator in that case coming for the next case. Dr. Seidel was in on that case as well, did an excellent job as well, carefully dissecting. <clears throat> and Again, we're going to the other extreme of the spine now. All right, so yeah, I have a case to present, not quite as complex as the one Amanda just presented, but interesting nonetheless. So this is a 69-year-old male. He presented to clinic with six months of low back pain, right leg pain that went down to the foot. He's also complained of difficulty emptying his bladder with urinary frequency. Of note, he had a history of tonsillar cancer with metastases to his lymph nodes, status post a resection, radiation, and chemotherapy about a year and a half ago. Uh, on exam, he had some weakness uh, in his ankle dorsiflexion and EHL on the right, mild decrease in sensation of S1 on the right, positive right side of Trindellenburg as well. So these are preoperative images uh, on x-ray. You can obviously see there's a winking sign, uh, winking owl sign down at L5 there. That's all you can really glean from this. And then- uh, Can you go back to that image and just sure. use your cursor for a second? So yes. So not light at this, the cursor and outline the owl sign. Right here. You can kind of see yeah, the pedicles. Yeah, so is, the pedicle is eroded is and the eroded. goes all the way down to the ala, yeah. includes the ala. Okay. And that was missed, I think. Yeah, I don't know if that was uh, commented on by radiology, but we saw it. And here's some preoperative CT imaging. You can see that this demonstrates a fluid-filled lytic lesion, um, or assumably fluid-filled invading L5, severely compressing right L5 and S1 nerve roots, and has sclerotic margins around the edges. I'll play it one more time. So again, we always look at the margins. There's obviously an expansile lytic lesion. Um, mm -hmm. Chris, as you looked at this, is it more a lytic margin, or is it more a sclerotic margin, or how would you characterize the response of the host the lesion? I think it's more of a sclerotic margin. I think the host is trying to wall it off. So it's not aggressively invasive. It doesn't appear it's to expansile. be. It's expansile. Yeah. yeah. All right. And do you have the MRI? Yep. If I could get it to go to the next slide. There we go. All right. On MRI, you can see again that cystic lesion. Um, interestingly, there's a fluid fluid sign here typically correlated with ABCs, which can be secondary in many. Um, and what does ABC bone stand for? Just aneurysmal bone cyst. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a clear fluid sign. And so Tim, as you're watching this, so this man had a history of a tonsillar cancer about a year and a half ago. 
otherwise a very healthy, very active person. Uh, the treatment of that was done at an outside hospital. We're not totally sure uh, what we gathered from that, but it seems to have been a uh, incomplete treatment as in subtotal resection and uh, more supplemental chemotherapy and um, radiation. It's very functional male, very active. So should we biopsy this? And if so, what are the problems with a biopsy uh, to make this actually meaningful? Because it's no problem getting a needle into the cyst, but is that a meaningful specimen that you get from there? Yeah, so those were the, the questions that were kind of raised here. Yeah. Yeah. So Tim, could, did you see this case? Well, last year, okay. Uh, Rod, what do you think? Should we biopsy this, man? This is the stereotypical answer when we have tumor, uh, your beautiful spine tumor conference. Um, so do we biopsy routinely? And if so, how can we make sure that this is actually a representative tissue specimen? I mean, I think um, given this cancer history um, and, you know, having that kind of as a background, I think um, makes me worried this is metastasis. Mm -hmm. So I probably would do more imaging, but I'm not sure. Again, I think you have to, with cancer cases, it's kind of tricky because, you know, what's the ultimate goal? You know, does the guy have a lot of pain? Um, you know, if this is a metastasis, is there other lesions involved? And then I think if the goal is to diagnose it, I think biopsy is reasonable. I think if the goal is to stabilize that area and if pain is an issue, then I think surgery is a good option. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, all these are on the table. So you did a nice job. To tell us what these numbers mean, Chris, if you will. Yeah, so the Spine Oncology Study Group METS compression grade. Uh, it it's a, evaluates core compression of a metastasis. So a zero would be if the tumor is consi confined to bone only. One, if the tumor uh, extends to the epidural space without deformation of the spinal cord. Um, and then two is spinal cord compression, but you can see CSF still. Three is spinal cord compression without visible CSF. If you have grade one broken down further, it's subdivided into A, B, and C. Uh, a being an epidural impingement, uh, but no deformation of the thecal sac. B being a deformation of the thecal sac, but without any spinal cord abutment. And C, deformation of the thecal sac uh, with spinal cord abutment without compression, though. Um, and then obviously the SIN score of nine, because this patient had a junctional lesion, uh, mechanical pain, it was lytic in nature. He did have normal alignment uh, with no vertebral collapse uh, and unilaterally involved the posterior lateral uh, elements. So that makes it uh, a nine, which is potentially unstable in that seven to 12 range. So Rod, would your thoughts of getting a biopsy change in light of the fact that the patient has severe pain, uh, neurologic pain, has a very hard time walking, is a very stoic individual, would that change? Because a biopsy nowadays means a, you don't get an answer usually within 24 hours. Um, it's usually a almost a week-long waiting game. And again, you're totally dependent upon the radiologist yeah. getting the needle into the lesional tissue, not into the cyst. Right. Um, and what was the, so he was admitted for to the hospital is that what the yeah he okay. uh, he actually wasn't admitted he came in we scheduled him for surgery Got though it. um within a couple of days of okay. seeing him yeah i mean i think if again um i think it's not unreasonable but you, it's going to take two weeks to get an answer and sure i don't think it's going to get rid of his pain um and again uh, depending on what the metastatic work up, workup reveals, I don't think um, it's unreasonable uh, to consider doing intralesional resection. Yeah. So you wouldn't go for radicality? He I did mean, have I, a bone yeah. scan, which showed this was an isolated skeletal metastasis. Yeah. yeah. We didn't know it at the time, though, yeah. right? Yeah. All right. Why don't we go ahead with what we did? All right. So... We proceeded with a right L5 S1 tumor resection, decompression at that area. Uh, PMMA used to fill the tumor bed dead space, instrumentation from four to the pelvis with a triple rod construct. And you see we got good fill with our P 
PMMA in that dead space. So Rod, so we filled up, or we tried to fill up the cavity with cement. Uh, I liked mm -hmm. it as dead space management. Is that nonsense? What do you think about that? Um, what was the, uh, so when you So we guys... had an interoperative specimen sent off, yeah. pathology came by, and they felt this was a metastatic lesion. So this is at this point in time a, a uh, kind of a damage control, sure. mobility oriented procedure. I mean, I think I think it's uh, I I haven't used cement a lot posterolaterally. I've used it in. I think it's a it's a great um, you know if you're doing a vertebrectomy and and you have a partial vertebral body left. Um, I have actually not used it in this in posterolaterally like this. But I think um, the main thing for these cases are, you know, I think you achieved a nice resection um, and looks like you skeletonized the nerve root which was being compressed. Um, and uh, had a nice construct there. Um, what'd you do for the fusion? Chris, what did we do for the fusion? Did we use any local bone graft? We did not use any local bone graft, mm -hmm. uh, all allograft. I think with cancer cases, the hardest thing for me, Jens, is getting these patients to fuse um, yeah. and then not having this thing, the wound fall apart after radiation. Yeah. So is there any any um, other things you guys did in terms of closure or wound management? No, um, it was a pretty standard closure after mm -hmm. that. Made sure the tumor bed was very dry. Um, we did use hydrogen peroxide um, to bathe the area just to control local bleeding mm -hmm. because of uh, the nature of the, the tumor. You could see the fluid flu level, there was blood in there. Uh, so we um, were very meticulous on the tumor bed with the uh, bipolar um, and you guys did closure. a quad rod construct can you triple rod construct triple rod. so we did a, a do you have an overview Let's picture I, I don't a, have an x-ray we only had a ct i should have included the scalp but so we did a dual rod on the lesion side rod yeah. with mm -hmm. stacked screws so we put dual screws in on the side and basically went two levels above and did a dual rod on the lesion side to get maximum purchase and we could not put an S1 screw into the lesion mm -hmm. side on that side. On the control outside, we did a unilateral rod. Mm -hmm. Should we have done a quad rod on both sides? Um, you know, honestly, I think, uh, like I said, I'm not sure. I think, I think getting it to fuse, I think the um, arthrodesis part is probably the most important. I think it looks like you got enough fixation in there. How unstable was it on that one side? It wasn't very unstable. Okay. So I think I think um, it's it, I think you did a good job of you know um, realigning and decompressing. Anything you would do differently, Chris? No, um, and like you already mentioned, it came back as metastatic squamous cell carcinoma consistent with his prior cancer. Now, in all honesty, we lost over a liter of blood. It wasn't horrendous, but we were very careful. But still. Mm -hmm. Rod, should we embolize those? I mean, I used to embolize a lot more, but lumbosacral junction, does it make sense to try to embolize that? Um, boy, uh, I'm not sure I would have embolized this one. Um, in fact, I think on that scan, you could see there was some blood already in it. Yeah. So maybe, um, you know, and, and again, it's case dependent, obviously, if it's history renal cell or some tumor that you think is blood going to be very vascular or thyroid, I would probably embolize it. But I, I think you did. I, I don't think it was unreasonable to not embolize. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've mm -hmm. not embolized lumbosacral lesions anymore because they're just uh, not consistent. If there's not a focal segmental artery that I've been able to find, unlike the thoracic spine. Mm -hmm. So. All right, let's hope that he mobilizes well. And he's actually gone home pretty rapidly also yeah, after surgery. He was, day three, yeah, doing great. Great. And we have one more case before we have Dr. Witham's lecture. And nonetheless, thank you, Chris. And we have Dr. Abe Schlaudraff. And this is a case that I don't know of. So I'm very curious <laughs> to see what you're going to present here. All right. So I'm presenting a case, 80-year-old gentleman that came to our clinic. Prior history, more dist, uh, distant 20 years ago, prostate cancer, well controlled, his PSA levels were, were normal, uh, essentially been lost to follow up for that because 
was no longer an issue for him. More recently, he uh, developed renal cell carcinoma two years ago, had a partial left side nephrectomy. No known metastases, but he said he never had any oncology follow-up, which was kind of interesting. Uh, he developed mild neck pain and shoulder pain around Christmas time this last year. Uh, originally shrugged off, did some physical therapy, some outpatient, more conservative uh, treatment, and then ended up having imaging. On his uh, imaging, he was found to have a multi-level, likely cervical metastasis from his uh, renal cell carcinoma, which is why he was referred to us. Uh, he additionally had a bony pelvic lesion, uh, which was biopsied, but they couldn't get any lesional tissue. Um, he is asymptomatic besides neck pain, no myelopathy uh, symptoms or uh, features in physical exam. Uh, exam, he has a normal exam, full strength, normal reflexes, uh, normal sensation. Here you can see on his imaging on the left, uh, you can see his CT. CT is showing a three level vertebral body, uh, lick, uh, renal cell metastasis, eccentric off to the right side, uh, going into the vert uh, region. You can see there on the uh, CTA uh, that the vertebral artery is kind of pushed eccentrically off to the right side, lateral to the mass. However, there is some tumor that is uh, going uh, ventral to it and a little bit lateral to it as well. It does extend posteriorly into the uh, canal, however, it's not causing him significant compression or uh, is very symptomatic. There on the x-ray skull C, he does have some uh, collapse there as well on that involved level. On his MRI, kind of showing the same things. You can see how he does have some vertebral body, vertebral body collapse with some retropulsion there uh, and three level involvement. So this is a, okay, sorry, you go for it, go for it. Uh, so since score, I gave him a, a 13 for being a mobile segment, him having mechanical neck pain, being a lytic lesion. He does have some uh, deformity of kyph uh, kyphosis there in his neck. He has greater than 50% vertebral body collapse, C4, and has unilateral posterior involvement over on the right side. So 13, again, if you go back to that score, the SIN score is very helpful. What does that mean? Is that a clear indication for surgery? Yeah, I think so, given, given the gestalt, everything going What's on. What's the cutoff line again between intermediate and uh, clear surgery? 12 would be. Yeah, 12, 11, 12, yeah, gets into that range. But this is, again, just a checklist more and not absolute. So how healthy was this patient before? And you said he's in his 80s? Very, very healthy. Surprised a very healthy 80-year-old, minimal other medical issues, does have the 20-year remote history of prostate cancer, which has been well-controlled. A partial nephrectomy with renal cell carcinoma, I thought it was well-controlled. Without any of no metastatic disease besides one leash in the pelvis, one leash in the neck, but very healthy. And again, the vertebral artery condition, how was that identified? Did you do a CTA or? We have a CTA, you can see. I don't know if you can see that. Up, you can see the vertebral artery. Is it's it definitely open? The, there is open. We follow all the way up. And on the coronal, I try to get a good slice of the coronal. You can see it there, eccentric off to the right side, but widely patent. There is some tumor that wraps around the side of it that's ventral and a little bit lateral. So we can't ask Dr. Witham right now because he's just seeing a patient in Baltimore. But this is a pretty substantial problem. There's a mechanical component to this with some significant pain. There's some weakness, yep. uh, direct or indirect in nature. And again, this is an older skeleton. There's some osteopenia there without a question. So I think uh, that surgery is very much in the cards. Um, in your training at Penn State, what would you have been told to do? Uh, obviously, there's an anterior lesion. It's very tempting yep. to go anteriorly. So. What are your thoughts? What were you trained I, I, in? Yeah, I think similar to what, we, what we're planning to do here. Um, so as far as considerations of renal cell carcinoma, so it's probably gonna bleed pretty significantly. So pre-op embolization is one thing that we talked about doing, which is definitely something we have done at Penn State. Uh, anterior column reconstruction with the multi-level corpectomy and try to do as much uh, gross total resection as you can of the tumor. Although there may be still some lateral febrile artery in areas that are difficult to get to, which will probably have to be followed with radiation. So with that, you're probably going to want to use some type of uh, something that's not highly dense metal that will cause more scatter, scatter artifact when you're doing your radiation. So something like, I suppose, peak or probably fibular strut would be best. Um, and know the vertebral artery anatomy very well and knowing that there could be a potential injury and talk to the patient about what can happen if you dissect it, uh, cause a stroke or a bleed as well. 
both temporal arteries are equal in caliber. There's not one that's uh, narrowed or uh, dominant. They're both equal. And we're talking about augmented reality, so maybe kind of like Amanda did, maybe augmented reality prep planning for looking at the temporal artery and the tumor relationship to that and then the nervous structures may be helpful. But Tell us again about concepts of radicality in a metastatic disease versus kind of just a functional separation surgery and uh, effective stabilization, leaving yeah. the tumor behind. What are the thoughts there? So in someone who's 80 years old with met mets elsewhere and such in the pelvis, there's probably going to be other mets as well. Uh, if you do a full staging scan, they'll probably pop up or maybe a... Uh, a nuclear med study, which he's not had done. So I think given that he's 80, it's probably not as and quite as important if he was 50 and had a longer life expectancy, I suppose. Um, I think with him, he's going to get radiation afterwards. I think separation surgery at a minimum and cage reconstruction to stabilize his spine is important and try to get as much tumor out as you possibly can. We're going to go from the front and from the back. This does have some posterior element involvement. When you have a three level corpectomy, I think doing it from the front alone, that's too much. Uh, too many levels for it to be no standalone. And would there be a benefit to going posteriorly first to have a stable um, scaffolding more or less for your spine and then an all calm taking out the front tumor at a second surgery in a multi-level situation like this? That's not, yeah, not, bad, not a bad idea. Yeah. That's... Yeah, because his alignment's fairly reasonable. He's not, he does have tubal body collapse, but he's not very kyphotic there. So yeah. you'd have that's a reasonable one thing alignment. I'd prefer if I have to do a multi-level or complex anterior resection. The instinct is so strong to go in the front and I'm going to take that out and replace that, but the bone stock here is very impaired and when we get into multi-level situation, mechanically it becomes very unsteady. Yeah. 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 Okay. Curious to see what you did. Well, we well, didn't do anything. I think one of the reasons oh. why we presented is that, um, go back uh, yeah. if you can, a great presentation is, you know, he's, um, he's 80. He's very functional, and he's a little bit on the fence about whether he wants to have surgery or not. And so um, I've seen him now uh, two or three times, and, you know, it's uh, he's really thinking seriously about doing it. But, you know, I don't know what the right answer is um, because he really does not want to um, have a stroke or have any complications. And Nobody wants complications, yeah. and we don't want complications either. I mean, this is a, a difficult decision making. Uh, I've been very impressed with that case of one where we use that um, imaging technology. I don't want to mention the name because we're in the CME part and it's not on label yet. But for planning purposes, I think it's uh, we can say the name is Medivis, uh, that holologic system. I thought that was actually very helpful to look at the spine and just walk through it. Literally, you can walk through it. Uh, so. Uh, um, Personally, I would favor surgery. Um, easy for me to say, but if this patient has quality of life in mind, this is going to end uh, this patient's life, um, and it's more hospice care situation. Uh, outpatient palliative care is still something that we don't have enough of, I think, mm -hmm. right? Uh, inpatient palliative care is not a problem. They do a terrific job. They're very, very good at having important end-of-life discussions and quality-of-life discussions. Um, and expectations of the patients, their family, they're very inclusive, but in an outpatient setting, I've just not seen that mature to that degree for some reason. It's very labor intensive and there's not a good billing situation. So the reimbursements is just not there, frankly. Um, personally, I would advocate in favor of a posterior procedure first to give the patient the highest chance of um, having a stable neck and decompressing the cord a little bit, getting a fusion. And I would then, as a secondary surgery, it gives you time uh, probably do it, uh, it looks like a three-level corpectomy, and then you don't even need to do a large plate in the front. You can do that still, but um, the dissection of your right-sided vertebral artery will be far more controlled and easy. Uh, so my, my personal favor would be actually to go posteriorly first, get mm -hmm. the more painful part out first, not have to rely on an anterior plate, and then an all-calm with a carotid-type exposure on the right side, dissect out uh, the vertebral artery, and then resect the lesion. And that actually then becomes, in my experience, a far more controlled, comfortable surgeon. You can wait for a couple of days, or you can do it in the same day, but depending on how the posterior part goes. That's my, my thought. And there's some lateral mass involvement from the right side, so you can actually dissect out uh, part of the vertebral artery from the backside. 
as you show on that CT. Mm -hmm. Those are my thoughts. Um, is Dr. Witham back? Can we call Dr. Witham back? Okay. Otherwise, we'll want to switch this talk. Uh, so you would go from the front first, Abe, in your setting? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I uh, think three level in, corpectomy. In state yeah. urban. Yeah, pre op embolization, day one, then three level corpectomy, and then going from behind. So when you say embolization, would you sacrifice the vertebral artery, the trial occlusion? What do you mean with embolization? Uh, see if there's any arterial feeders to the tumor coming off of there. Because they're getting more and more magic with small vessels, but I'm not sure what feeders they would get there. I, again, for the yeah. cervical spine, I've actually not done that anymore. Uh, cervical thoracic is debatable, it depends upon the suspected lesion like a chondrosarcoma. So, but in the mid cervical spine, I've not seen major feeders. I'm curious what our neurosurgical vascular colleagues would say about that. Yeah. Rod, any thoughts? I mean, this, the main question is do you sacrifice the vertebral artery and doing a trial balloon occlusion and sacrificing that might be interesting, but then you can't, you have to be very careful on the yeah. contralateral side with your fixation. You probably can't do the optimal fixation there. I'm not sure I would sacrifice this one um, uh, before surgery, but I do think because it's probably going to be renal cell, I think emboli preoperative embolization and angiogram is, would be helpful. That's where I like the posterior yeah. surgery first uh, a lot because you have far more chances to control the bleeding from the yeah. back. You can actually dissect the vertebral artery pretty well. And again, if there's a catastrophe or a problem, you can control it in surgery. So mm -hmm. this is why I'd advocate in favor of posterior first and get a stable neck. And then you can approach the front again, I think personally far more relaxed, but that's subjective to some degree. I don't have any immediate data on that. No, those are great points. Um, and uh, I think for me, you know, the main thing was is um, I think because he's 80 and you know, just I think they're like you said. I mean, it's a it's a tough situation. As oncologist is kind of doomsday, and and um, and because he, I mean, he just feels great and looks so good. He's a little bit hesitant to do anything right now. So we kind of talked about he's going to I think follow up in three months. Oh um, wow! Yeah, he's a ve he's very um, even his collar. Like he he brought his collar. He he had collar and and he's like you know doesn't really do that much for me wow okay yeah, so a very stoic man yeah these are difficult decisions and multifactorial obviously and i assume and i hope that he has good family and uh, emotional support great great case um so thank you abe and thank you to our fellows uh, chris and amanda for their great case presentations and it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Witham. Um, uh, Dr. Witham is from uh, the Department of Neurological Surgery. He's also a professor of orthopedic surgery at Johns Hopkins. And uh, he's had a very distinguished past um, uh, background. He has a bachelor's in biochemistry from Pennsylvania State University, so Abe's alma mater. And he does MD at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. There's residency in Pittsburgh and then did a fellowship at Johns Hopkins and stayed on faculty there. He was also the chief neurosurgeon at Kessler Medical Center in the Kiesler Air Force Base. So he served our country with distinction in the Air Force. And he is uh, extensively published um, in our literature, over 170 articles. He's a top doctor and he has a meritorious service medal in our Air Force. Uh, so he's a very distinguished colleague. Um, he is the chief of the Spinal Fusion Laboratory at Johns Hopkins Neurosurgery Program, and he's also the program director at Johns Hopkins Neurosurgery Residency Program. So he's a, a very accomplished person, and I know him uh, from many realms, but he's been uh, really attention getting with a newer technology, I'm not going to mention the name of that, where we can basically visualize in a heads-up display like an Air Force pilot in the Generation 5 uh, fighter jet where you can superimpose radiographic images on a patient in surgery and try to visualize an augmented reality uh, what we're trying to do. So that's a very compelling technology that basically takes away the staring at a monitor and puts it into the patient's realm. And so he's exploring in this talk what it means to do um, and what it means to use augmented reality in a real life a spine surgery situation. So uh, I'll ask Ben and Angela to switch us to his talk.
So I'm Tim Witham. I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Chapman and the Seattle Science Foundation for allowing me to speak a little bit today about augmented reality applications and spine surgery. Um, the future is finally here. I would probably modify that to say that a glimpse of the future is finally here, but I can certainly give you an introduction uh, on this topic. Um, I do want to disclose that I am conflicted. I am a medical advisory board member and investor in Augmetics, which makes the X-Vision augmented reality headset, which is the device that I've had a fair amount of experience using here early on. Now, there are a number of different ways to place spinal instrumentation. Um, and basically the best way to do it is the way that works best in your hands. Additionally, I would say that there is no technique that we have available that is 100% accurate in placing spinal instrumentation. I always tell our residents are very fortunate because one of my partners is a big robotics user. Another one does freehand technique. I did freehand technique for probably, oh, 15 years or more. Um, and now I've had the chance to work with um, the X Vision and using augmented reality. But even with intraoperative CT scan, which we've utilized, there is not a 100% accuracy rate really with any technique. So use what is best in your hands. Now, standard navigation systems and robotics have certain um, limitations, uh, including line of sight interruption from a remote camera and three point shift. But one of the big ones is this concept of attention shift. And that is this concept whereby you have to look away from the patient at a remote computer screen while you're operating on the patient in front of you. And most surgeons that utilize this technique are, are extremely good at adapting to that, but it can negatively impact cognitive and motor tasks. Now, augmented reality may be a solution for this. Um, and what augmented reality is from a definition perspective is when you take a computer generated image and you overlay that image on your view of the real world, making a composite or augmented image. And this has actually been used in spine surgery in a, in a variety of different ways. Uh, this is Barbara Carl's group out of Germany. They use the um, uh, intraoperative uh, uh, CT scan and they can um, augment that or integrate that with preoperative MR imaging. This is the brain lab system and they use these image images that are generated and overlay those images uh, on their view through an operating microscope. This does require a remote camera, as you can see there, um, but they've used this uh, successfully in a number of different scenarios, most commonly with uh, spinal tumors, uh, but also uh, with the instrumentation uh, placement, particularly when placed anteriorly. Uh, they've utilized this technique and have found it to be very helpful in terms of identifying at-risk structures as well as the target structures or normal tissues where they're trying to place instrumentation. Dr. Elmi Terender out of the Netherlands uh, has used this system, which is a um, integrated fluoro uh, 2D, 3D CT, which has the camera inside of the fluoro machine. Um, these images are then displayed on a remote screen uh, that has the computer generated overlay uh, while uh, the camera is filming the operative uh, procedure. Again, this requires, requires a remote screen to look at while you're performing the procedure, but they've demonstrated accuracy with spinal instrumentation at about a 94% rate in both cadaveric and human studies. Uh, this is a group uh, out of France that has used a similar uh, integrated uh, 2D, 3D fluoro machine, uh, which has the camera inside of the fluoro. And they've looked at this actually in human studies with 20 consecutive T-lift patients. And they also demonstrated a 94% accuracy rate with spinal instrumentation placement. This is the X-Vision which is a head-mounted display system developed by Augmentic, Augmetics, as I mentioned. 
This uh, particular headset was based on fighter pilot technology developed by an Israeli biomedical engineer. Uh, the headset includes a camera that is inside of that camera and all of the navigation machinery is inside of this headset, which is battery powered. So it has the camera that tracks a patient marker and a tool marker that you're using and then projects this computer generated image from an intraoperative CT scan directly on your retina through those lenses shown there uh, as C. For the workflow for this, uh, it can be done percutaneously and open. I have done mostly open cases, but I've done some percutaneous cases as well. Uh, there is on the left a registration marker that is placed and then an intraoperative CT is performed. Uh, this system will be going to a preoperative registration system where it can be registered from a preoperative CT to a uh, couple of fluoro shots intraoperatively. But right now it does require the use of an intraoperative CT. After the CT is acquired, that data is then sent to the headset through the um, uh, image uh, uh, data set. Uh, and then there is a uh, patient marker shown here in the middle and a tool marker that is tracked by the headset while you're looking directly into the operating field while you're operating. And this is sort of gives you an idea of the setup and what the, the, what the surgeon sees. Uh, in the middle screen are the three different uh, views that you get, an axial, sagittal, and then a 3D reconstructed view. And then to the right, you can kind of see what the image looks like when it's overlaid on the, uh, on the patient as you're looking inside the patient. Right now, this is uh, one of uh, two FDA approved systems. This is a surge line uh, system, which was recently FDA approved. I don't have much experience using it, but it does uh, look quite interesting. It requires this almost translucent uh, screen um, I don't know if that is at all cumbersome for the surgeon. I've, again, not used it, um, but this is a, uh, a new device that is recently FDA approved. It does require a remote camera and has a tool tracker and patient tracker as well. And the uh, augmented uh, or composite images are overlaid onto the surgeon's uh, view of the operative field through that uh, translucent screen that you can see there. Um, there are rumblings from another company, a Swiss company called Medacta, um, who are um, sort of proclaiming that they will have an entire navigation ecosystem, if you will, for all orthopedic and uh, spine procedures. Um, I think they are in the process of FDA approval, and I think it's exciting that you know there will be a competitor with a head-mounted type of uh, glasses for uh, navigation in the spine. So very interested to see um, what the Medacta system looks like here in the future. There are other examples of uh, AR with head-mounted display that are not yet uh, used uh, clinically. Uh, this was Larry Lanky's group that published on um, the use of um, the Magic Leap uh, augmented reality system. Uh, and they showed that this had a high accuracy in um, a Sawbones model um, at a 98% accuracy rate. It was, they looked at it with both experienced surgeons and, and residents, uh, and again, a very high accuracy rate. I will point out that the Magic Leap system is an aftermarket uh, augmented reality system. It was not uh, designed uh, specifically for medical applications. Um, Initially, and I'm not sure if the technology has changed yet or not, but initially it was set up with the requirement of a remote computer or NDI camera uh, uh, because the camera was not integrated into the headset itself. So a little bit different, uh, but nonetheless a, a possibility for the future. Um, this is another group uh, out of uh, France, or excuse me, uh, Switzerland. Uh, that have used the uh, Microsoft HoloLens, similar concept to the Mac Magic Leap, and they've shown uh, this is uh, feasible using, again, a Sawbones model with, with a good accuracy rate for placing spinal instrumentation. 
Um, Dr. Elmi Terender and his group uh, have also looked at the Magic Leap system similar to Dr. Lanky. Uh, again, they've uh, used this in spine phantoms and have again demonstrated a high accuracy rate for placing pedicle screws at about 94%. Um, again, the, the group uh, out of uh, France has looked at um, the use, or excuse me, out of Switzerland, again, I want to confuse those two, uh, the use of the uh, hollow lens again uh, for placement of S2 AI screws uh, and have demonstrated a very low uh, perforation rate when they again use this in uh, Sawbones model. <clears throat> and this is interesting because this is something that I've been interested in using the AR for uh, with the X Vision. I'll show you some of our data on that as well. So um, I'm going to now, for the next part of the talk, focus a little bit on um, the X Vision and, and the experience with the X Vision, which was the first FDA approved um, augmented reality system for spine surgery in the United States. Uh, the process for FDA approval came through uh, cadaveric studies. Um, both open and MIS, which had to demonstrate um, the accuracy of uh, instrumentation placement using this um, system. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be involved with the first open cadaveric study on the left, uh, and the accuracy rate came in at about 95%. It was subsequently done with a percutaneous uh, cadaveric study that was done out of Rush with uh, Larry Koo, Frank Phillips, uh, one of our residents, Camilla Molina, and they were able to, again, demonstrate a very high accuracy rate of about 98%. The pedicle screws an even higher uh, rate of instrumentation or uh, rate of accuracy with jam sheeting needle placement, which was something that the FDA uh, asked uh, for in that study. Uh, I was also fortunate enough to be involved in the first uh, inhuman use of this device in June of 2020 and we performed a, a decompression infusion from L4 to S1 on a patient with spondylolisthesis and uh, neurogenic claudication from stenosis. Um, and this just shows uh, some of the uh, uh, views intraoperatively from uh, that, that first case that we did. We, did, we really wanted to start with kind of a, a more of a common or, or, or maybe relatively more routine type of case to, to demonstrate the accuracy and feasibility of it. Uh, we had 100% accuracy rate of our screw placement. I'm not going to show the vid video, but just point out to you that here, uh, my partner Dan Shuba got on the, the news feed here, uh, even though I was uh, the uh, primary surgeon on the case, but that's the way it goes. Um, we were also uh, uh, interested in, or have been interested in, in this first case, we looked at the precision because Accuracy is somewhat different than precision. Accuracy says you can hit the target, uh, but what precision says is it says that the screw is placed where the computer says the screw is being placed. So this requires re-registering after the instrumentation is placed and then doing a post-operative CT scan to see, did we in fact place the instrumentation where, where the system, where the augmented reality system said we were gonna place the instrumentation? And when we did that in this first case, uh, we were able to demonstrate that there is a mean linear deviation of about two millimeters, and the angular deviation of those screws is about 2.4 degrees, which compares very favorably to other navigation systems that are available, such as the Stealth Station or the Globus. I'm not here to make a claim that this is the best. Like I said from the outset, the best system is what works the best in your but it looks like this system is accurate and precise in some of our initial work. Um, we've also been interested in, in accumulating and acquiring additional data. This just shows some of the data that we, that we try to accumulate, looking at workflow and efficiency and looking at our times and seeing how we can improve our times while we're doing surgeries. This was just another case of an L4 to S1 fusion, but this is some of the data that we, we capture to look at these different parameters and, and collect data and try to find out if, you know, if what we're doing is, is really feasible from an efficacy and efficiency standpoint and workflow standpoint. 
Uh, and so we, we did publish our first 205 screws on the accuracy rate, uh, and it comes in at about 98% accurate. If you look at the gerstmann robin scale, where a, where a grade A and a B are considered accurate, that's less than two millimeter for each of the grade B, and we came in at 98% on that. Similarly, uh, Dr. Gizzini, Chris Good, Tom Schuler out of the Virginia Spine Group, uh, they published uh, their first 208 screws came up with a similar accuracy rate in kind of the 94% range. So it can be reproducible. Um, we've also uh, uh, looked at, this was a study, uh, one of our former residents, uh, Camilla Molina, looking at his data at Wash U, and then also a group out in Israel that have used the system, uh, and they come in at, a, at an accuracy rate of about uh, 90, 97%. Um, so, so the system is reproducible, it seems, so far. Uh, uh, Dr. Molina also at WashU and their group looked at the percutaneous uh, utilization of this device. They were actually able to, to, to place a uh, small number of screws, 63, with 100% accuracy in a, in a percutaneous uh, cohort. So the percutaneous application also appears to be very accurate. Uh, I've been very interested in cases uh, where we've utilized S2AI screw placement. I think it's a very nice um, application of this uh, technique. Uh, this was a patient where I did a revision uh, fusion. They had failed at L5S1 following an L2 to S1 fusion. Uh, in addition to uh, the pseudoarthrosis, there was a broken screw at S1, and I did find the technology to be very useful to place an additional S1 screw around that sort of distal fragment of the screw or distal piece of the screw that I was unable to remove. And then also uh, it was very seamless in placing uh, S2AI uh, screws and I find it very useful for that um, indication. Uh, this is uh, another uh, case in a, in a woman uh, where uh, we place dual S2AI screws. And I think this is, a, is also a very uh, sort of neat and slick way uh, when you have to do, let's say, a revision case and you want additional pelvic fixation. Um, maybe the S1 screws are, are haloed out and you want to get dual fixation in the, uh, for your pelvic fixation. And so this was a case where we were able to to, to very nicely, I thought, uh, revise the distal failed fusion and, and place these dual S2 ALR LEX screws uh, pretty easily. Um, we looked at our series on S2 AI screws and uh, it, it uh, comes in uh, very accurate, probably about 91%. We did have uh, a couple of cases where we breached. And one of the things you can notice actually on that upper right screen, uh, we had to solve some workflow issues uh, with um, being able to actually visualize the entire trajectory of the S2 ALR LAX screws. Um, and we've uh, subsequently been able to work that out. But you can see here, some of the, those two breaches in our initial series were thought to be potentially related to the fact that we weren't navigating all the way down the trajectory. So we weren't seeing the final uh, destination. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, very accurate. Um, this is a video here. So the one thing I do want to point out on there, it's actually very difficult to video because you actually have to put the camera 
uh, over the lenses of the headset. So we're still working out, trying to uh, show uh, surgeons uh, what the view actually is that you see. Um, the view is actually better than was demonstrated on that video, but it's just the technical limitation of trying to video, put, put a camera uh, through the lenses to see, see what's going on. Um, this was an interesting case. I actually had the opportunity to present this uh, a couple of weeks back uh, uh, at the pelvic trauma session for the uh, SSF. Um, but this was a case of spondyloptosis where I found the um, uh, AR to be really vital in being able to, to place dual S2 AI screws and then also capture that, that uh, S1 fragment uh, it was about a mile deep in the operative field and then and then reduce uh, that fracture. So it could certainly be done with uh, robotic navigation or standard navigation, but but this was a case that again, uh, I used the AR for and, and felt it would be very, very helpful. You know, it's interesting to place instrumentation using this technology, but really it's gonna have to do more than that. And I think a lot of the platforms are gonna have to and so things like tumor resection, planning osteotomies, navigating inner bodies, these are things that are gonna happen in the future. And so this is an example of a paper we published. My uh, partner, Dan Shuba, uh, used the technology to plan his osteotomy cuts to remove this L1 uh, chordoma. And it was very useful in that instance uh, for them uh, to do that. Um, this is just another case of mine that I uh, found interesting. I, I use the percutaneous technique. This is, you know, a case that I would seldom have an occasion to operate on. It was a young man that presented with um, a gunshot wound, and, and I try to avoid any kind of surgery for a gunshot wound in the spine. Uh, but it just so happened that the the, the, you know, the projectile had basically just to completely destroyed his pedicle on the one side at L5, uh, as well as the entire facet complex. So I was worried about instability in this particular case, which I would say is un unusual with these injuries. Uh, so at the time, I did not have the percutaneous pin, which is available and is nice for um, MIS cases. So we did have to make a small incision to place the uh, registration marker on a uh, spinous process. but. I was able to um, uh, fairly quickly place uh, MIS percutaneous screws uh, uh, to stabilize this patient's uh, spine. It's been a great tool for um, reg resident education and teaching. I usually have them you know, work on kind of a sawbones type model before they try it out in the OR. Um, but, you know, for this is the video here. I don't even have the headset on. So I would point out that um, in some of these cases now, when I have some of the chief residents and more senior residents working with me, I actually call myself the coach. Sometimes I don't even put a headset on. Sometimes I'm just looking at the monitor. There's also a monitor, um, just like you would have with standard navigation. And I'll watch the residents actually place the, the screws. Our workflow is to use that AO drill, uh, followed by a navigated tap. If you don't like to place your screws until after your decompression, I usually like to at least make the holes. And then if I'm doing some osteotomies, I'll wait and then just place the screws into the holes that I've already made with AR and then I actually place the, the screws freehand. Um, but that's kind of just a demonstration of what it looks like. Um, the system is not without limitations. And a lot of the limitations are similar to the limitations of other uh, navigation systems. Um, we've had to abort a couple of cases because there were issues with the software and the registration. Um, and so workflow issues really are, are the main issue that, that we deal with. And so, you know, I'm looking at ways where we can improve
improve our workflow and efficiency. I think certainly when we're able to get the preoperative registration, this system is be going to become a lot more appealing, both in the setting of, let's say, an ambulatory surgery center, but also um, intraoperatively because it'll save on the time needed uh, for the imaging. Um, the headset's going to get better. It's a little bit large right now. It's going to turn into glasses, and I think that's going to make things a lot better as well uh, moving forward. Um, you know, I think the ability to uh, visualize the operative field is, is natural while you're working. I will say that I have used some standard navigation systems and that line of sight interruption that occurs with a remote camera is much less common with this system. There is a learning curve. It does take some getting used to. Right now it is totally vendor agnostic, so it can be used with any spinal instrumentation of your choosing. To finish up very quickly, um, there's been an initial study here. This was done through Dr. Molina and his group at Wash U, but the price point for the initial acquisition seems to be quite a bit lower than robotics, which I think is probably a big advantage, particularly if we're looking at using these technologies in the ambulatory surgery uh, setting. Uh, the per case cost, it comes in a little bit higher so far. Uh, complications profile seems to be the same as would be expected. Um, so um, to date, there have been about 51 institutions that have utilized the technology. Uh, these numbers are a little bit old. I've done over well over 100 cases and there have been at least 2,000 cases uh, performed in the U.S. Um, but really, as I mentioned before, it's, it's what this technology is gonna do in the future. And I think we have to continue to validate it. We have to continue to try to push the envelope a little bit more. There will be improvements over time. I think having more companies join the market is a good thing. We want competitors. We wanna push the field forward um, and make it better. But, but doing things like osteotomies, deformity correction, tumor resections, navigating inner bodies, doing corpectomies, these are the things that I think are going to occur in the future uh, and um, really differentiate this technology and I think make it uh, more worthwhile to consider using uh, for surgeons who want to potentially adopt this. Um, the work doesn't get done, uh, you know, in a vacuum. I've been fortunate enough to have a really great team here at Hopkins, including uh, Amanda, who's done a number of these cases with me and I know is doing a great job out there at Swedish. Uh, and then of course, uh, having an industry partner, I think, you know, people have mixed feelings on that, but you know, this is a situation which I think has been at least a good experience for me, pretty much the first time I've, I've done that. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish it up there. I hope this has been uh, informative and hopefully we can have a good discussion here to talk more about it in a critical fashion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim, for a great presentation. We'll <laughs> applaud here. Are you back live again? I am. Great. This is a really spectacular presentation, and we all appreciate it. Not just the great outlook on new technologies, but also your balanced perspective, which was patient safety, but also cost efficiency oriented, something that gets lost in the new tech implications. Um, my question to you is, I've previously published a accuracy study with Chris Shaffrey using a doesn't matter what, but a technology. But the whole time that Chris and I were doing this, we're talking about how hard it is for us to remain unbiased when we do our accuracy studies, because we obviously are and have to be not blinded towards what we're doing. And um, we've done just as you hundreds of thousands of screws, that's an exaggeration, but between 10,000 and well over 100,000 screws is a fair estimate. So we have a good feel, we have a touch feel of what is good and what doesn't work. So how can we avoid observer bias in an obviously unblinded technology when we try to show the accuracy of such technologies? Yeah, no, that's a, uh, a great question. I think that um, you can't avoid it completely, as you mentioned, um, but a couple of things that you can do, um, and I may have failed to mention in the video. Uh, number one, uh, I think it's really important that you always report consecutive number of screws. Um, 
because I can tell you, I've seen studies and I know for fact, uh, there have been studies published on different technologies where they, you know, the authors throw out their, a couple of their bad screws. So you have to, you got to report the consecutive screws, include all of them. Um, one of the other things you probably should do, which we did in this case, um, for our data, we always have an independent uh, radiologist review it. The, the, uh, the breach is not determined uh, by us. It's determined by the, by the radiologist. So outside of that, I mean, I'm not so sure uh, there's a lot else that you can do. As you mentioned, uh, you know, you are sort of champion, a champion of what you're doing, but um, you know, I think that uh, again, the, the screws aren't gonna be the most important thing most people can figure out a way to put screws in accurately. Yes, you're going to have a few that that miss They're, with any technique. Um, but I think the future is going to be using the technology for other things like you demonstrated in the prior uh, case uh, presentation. That, that's so valuable what you said there, because yes, putting in hardware like a robot for screw placement, excuse me, I mean, we, we have the Withema bot, we have the, the Rado bot or the Yenzo bot here. I mean, we're okay in putting in screws, not perfect, but pretty darn good. And those numbers that you mentioned in accuracy, I think we're there. But um, where I would really love to have this technology is if I can do a complex decompression or especially a tumor resection, like in that case that Dr. Seidel showed, I would have loved to have that technology of yours right there because looking around those nerve roots and seeing where does that cement go and how does that ventral S1 foramen relate to where I'm squashing cement in right now, I would have loved to have that. So yep. this is exactly, where are we with decompression techniques alone? You showed some cases where yeah. you had osteotome. Yeah, yeah, so I, the other day I didn't show it in here. I did a, uh, I did a little bit of a, actually a technique that, that you guys have recently described uh, uh, to avoid a three column osteotomy through the pedicle. Um, I've actually done some similar uh, cases as, as you guys have shown, but we did sort of a, a bit of a sacral dome osteotomy and used it to plan the cuts with our osteotome in a, in a case of an ismic uh, spondylolisthesis where the disc space was totally collapsed and we really had to remove part of the uh, superior posterior part of S1 to, to get into the disc space to, to mobilize that segment and do an inner body fusion and and potential reduction. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's not there yet, um, but it's something that we need to develop. And I think along those lines, um, even adding MR uh, technology to this is gonna be crucial uh, to be able to view the soft structures. Yeah, that'll be, that's, you preempted my next question, integrating other uh, uh, visualization forms, uh, imaging studies like MRI scan and CT scan at the flick of a switch, if you so will, would be a great enhancement. So that's, I guess, in the works. Yes, it is. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Rod, any thoughts? I mean, it's obviously very cool technology. Yeah, no, that was great. I mean, my only question is, is that, you know, it's always hard, you know, from a hospital perspective because a lot of this stuff you don't get reimbursed for and you know with reimbursement going down and you know you can see all the headlines all the hospitals losing a lot of money it's i always find it challenging because you want to bring in new technology and what do, what do you see as um down the road do you think there's going to be yeah. a reimbursement for this uh, you know, I don't know if that's true. I mean, I think that we're going to have to show that it's maybe safer, um, which is going to be very hard to show. So, so maybe not, but I think, um, that's a great point. Um, and I can tell you that, uh, I'm probably not quite as efficient with this technology as I was when I did freehand pedicle screws. I think I pr I'm probably faster with that. But there is a little bit, and it, and it helps, you know, there is more confidence in knowing that, hey, I'm not going to have to take someone back to the OR because I think this technology gives you a little bit of that. But where, to, to your point about cost, I think where this is really going to take off is in the ASC because, you know, a stealth station, I, I think, is uh, a, a, a much higher price point. 
A robot is certainly a much higher price point. And, and this may be a nice solution from a cost perspective in an ASC where people want to navigate. Um, so I think that's that may be you know a place where where it really takes off, you know in the hospital maybe not as much I think you know for us I, I even had to I had to beg to get this thing into our hospital and 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 you know we had done the first case and we we published the first you know three or four papers on it so I think we do need to provide the data and that's what I'm trying to do um, and that would also work toward you know reimbursement. All right, so we'll need to, we just got a memo we need to get out of here, uh, but thank you so much. I know it's a busy clinic day for you and you uh, spend your valuable time with us, gave us a great lecture and insights in our cases. So it's always a pleasure to have you with us and uh, thank you for this collaboration and sharing Dr. Sassina with us. It's a true pleasure. So have My a pleasure. Great, and uh, thank you. I'm sure we'll have follow-up questions and look forward to future meetings with you.